Hello and welcome back to Wind Your Neck In. As always, I'm your host, Niall. Um, it's a great pleasure of mine today to be welcoming Damien Hughes to the show. Damien, how are you keeping? I'm great, thanks, Niall, and really appreciate the, the kind invitation to come on, so looking forward to it. Yeah, no, the powers of LinkedIn have definitely uh, they've, they've got me through <laughs> here. A cheeky inbox message, and thank you so much for taking the time. Obviously, um, you know, a huge product that you and Jake Humphreys are putting out with the the high performance podcast and and I suppose at this point I have to get it off my chest I've watched and listened to loads of your stuff I'm a huge fan of the, the high performance podcast um I suppose I'm going to look, make you feel a little bit uncomfortable here I'm going to give you the option sure. actually I'm going to say because I've watched and listened to so much I know exactly how you'll intro yourself do you want to intro yourself sure. or shall I intro for you no, go on, you do it. it okay. It, 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 yeah, go on. I've seen enough of you, so I know exactly how you go about it. But, I, but hey, listen, <laughs> I'll give it a go. And if it doesn't work, you can fill in anything I've left, all right? Sure, so the on. man behind um, many of the best sports psychology books out there, Barcelona Way, The Winning Mindset, Liquid Thinking, and amongst others, but my absolute favourite, being an absolute massive Man United and all, is How to Think Like <laughs> Alex Ferguson. I enjoyed that so much. He also doubles up as a consultant for many elite level sports teams, including previously working with the Scottish rugby team in the preparation for the 2015 World Cup, which we'll get into. But also in, in, a, in a trio of, of forms, you're, you're involved in education as well. So a professor of organizational psychology and change at Manchester Met. You've dedicated your whole life to trying to figure out and understand and explore environments, culture, what makes people tick, how you bring people together and how they can be most successful, which takes us to the final point, as I, managed, as I mentioned before. Damien is one half of the High Performance Podcast with Jake Humphreys, in which they get to sit down and they discuss what high performance really is with some of the biggest people. And if you haven't put it into your, if you haven't subscribed, please do it. They've got amazing guests like Stephen Gerrard, Frank Lampard, Rio Ferdinand, amongst many others. It really is one of the best, and I do listen to it. So, how did it do? Oh, thanks, Niall. That's really kind. That's a really kind introduction. Everybody gets really weird about it. I said to A.B. de Villiers last week, like, my job's to pump you up. I mean, yeah. normally, um, <laughs> I watch so much of your stuff that you you kind of describe, you, 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 you pigeonhole yourself into those kind of three areas. So you say, I'm an elite level consultant. I'm an educationalist, if that's even a word. And... Um, and, and, and obviously the first question is like, which of those do you enjoy the most or is it impossible to say? Um, it's a really good question, but, um, I think I enjoy all of them. And I think the reason I do is, um, I did a bit of a reflection, like when I, like when I got into adulthood, I remember sort of once thinking, I wonder what my teachers would have said about me at school. Mm. And, um, I actually got the chance to ask one of them and their answer was, they said, you're a nice lad, but a bit of a pain in the ass." And they didn't mean it in a, uh, in a nasty way. What I think they meant was that I got bored easily. And when mm. I got bored easily, you start becoming a pain to the teachers. And what I realized as an adult was I need stimulation. So I need to have a few different things going on so that I can move between one to another and keep myself fresh and stop myself sort of, becoming stale so I see them all sort of fitting into the same thing so the stuff in education fits in terms of them being able to work in practice as a consultant and then I like doing the writing and the and the research side of the podcast because they all sort of dovetail nicely but there's yes. enough variety that keeps me keeps me interested yeah I mean of the of the books that you wrote do you do you reflect on any of them that were more challenging to 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 put out as a product I mean the, my favorite is the how to think like Sir Alex Ferguson because uh, ignorantly Sir Alex Ferguson is like the god of of how to, to manage and coach and you hear the stories and the insight yeah. you give is brilliant but for you is there one of them that stands out yeah the one that I'd say um I'm proudest of because I, I mean I'm proud of all of them but um the book I did uh, called The Winning Mindset is the one yeah. that, um, that, that that was quite personal. Like in like in my head when I was writing it, I wanted to write um, a bit of a love letter to my dad, if that makes sense. And I know that might sound a little bit twee, mm. but um, I grew up as a son of a coach. So um, um, my background was quite unusual now that I grew up in a boxing gym. So... Um, before I was born, my dad had uh, set up a boxing gym in inner city Manchester. Now, 
like most people's perceptions of boxing gyms, they're often in sort of inner city areas that are sort of economically challenged is a nice way of describing it. And that was certainly the case where, where I grew up. So it was an area of North Manchester where, where my dad was originally from and he set up the boxing gym there. So from as far back as I can remember, I grew up around sort of high performance, but also high performing cultures. So um, my playground was watching guys sort of prepare to go to the Olympic games or wow. guys uh, turning professional um, guys sort of going to for European and uh, world boxing on us. So I saw um, the hard work, the sacrifice, the discipline that went in behind high performance. But I think what I had greater empathy naturally through was the work that goes on in the shadows by the coaches, the sort of the, you know, the analysis, the, the, the time at home, the studying, um, the emotional intelligence and all of those things was something that I had a real empathy for because I could see it. And I think I wanted to write a book that was almost dedicated to my dad because I'd seen him do it for 40 odd years, but equally for all other coaches that were working in the shadows as well, often doing stuff that was unheralded that nobody would ever see. Even players would never recognise it. So that was the one that I felt was um, was the one that was personally most satisfying to do. It's an amazing book. And I think you probably, having not known that, I think you capture it brilliantly. Um, it's a great insight into um, the, the behind the scenes of, of those high performing cultures. I suppose in those early years through, through growing up in the boxing gym, I don't know if you're handy with your fist yourself, but was there a draw to try and <laughs> perform at the highest level as an athlete in any capacity or was it, or were you always drawn to the coaching and, and, the, and the kind of aid of it? Yeah. Um, so the short answer was, yeah. Like, um, so my dad wanted us to box uh, but he didn't. Uh, but he realised that boxing is one of those sports like you play rugby, you play football, but you only box. Yeah. <laughs> if uh, like it's not a sport you play at, and he was really keen that if you didn't have a natural capacity for it, don't do it because it's a sort of sport where you can get hurt, and yeah. there's plenty of people that would take advantage of you. So I think he realised quite quickly that I wasn't uh, ever going to be particularly good. I was okay at it, but I wasn't going to be particularly good. So he pushed us down the academic route in terms of, um, because his own story was interesting that he was um, he was an illegitimate, illiterate child of post-war Catholic Manchester. So um, he'd grown up without a father. And what his big driver was, was that like he'd, he'd been into boxing himself as a kid but he had no father figure around to guide him. So he'd gone into the sport and got himself quite badly hurt. He'd sort of had people throwing him in and nobody looking out for him. And um, I think that was a big driver. There was two things for him. I think he became a father figure to a lot of his fighters, but I think he was driven by making sure that anyone that came into it left it in a better state than what they came into it in. So he was really keen on things like that. But then there's so many life lessons that he was keen to teach us from it. So I remember there was a story that still sort of resonates and makes me cringe now, like <laughs> nearly 35 years later. But I remember when I was about 13 or 14 and uh, I was sparring one day in the gym. And uh, his whole thing about sparring was it's practice, it's practice, you help each other, you work in and it's all about technique. And I found myself sparring with the lad and I, and I was overmatched against him. So I, I, I was better than him, was faster and I was stronger. And... In a situation like that, you're supposed to then help develop your opponent and work on stuff. And I, I was a 13 year old idiot, so uh, I ended up sort of uh, my ego kicked in, and I ended up taking a bit of a liberty with this kid. So I was throwing big shots at him, I was slipping, and I, like I was bullying him for want of a better term. And we did our three rounds sparring, and as I was getting out, um, I was sort of climbing out, feeling pretty full of myself and my dad stopped me and he went where are you going I went I finished and he went yeah said, that wasn't a proper spy I said get back in so he kept me in the ring and then he put in a young professional boxer with me <laughs> and right. for the next the next nine minutes I, I can still recall it now in sort of like horrible technical clarity but it was the most humiliating 
experience of my life where this lad who came in the ring with me didn't physically hurt me, but mentally he scarred me. So he slipped every punch. He just kept jabbing me, knocking my head back, sort of making me look stupid, missing. And after we'd done our three rounds, because I, 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 I was also conscious that everyone in the gym had stopped to watch me get served this slice of humble pie because I'd seen <laughs> what I'd done. And as I was getting out, I, I can still remember like the tears of frustration and embarrassment. Yeah. And uh, my dad come over and he said, uh, he, he said, uh, how do you feel? And I couldn't speak. I was that choked up. And he just said to me quietly, he went, how you feel now is exactly how you made that boy feel just before. Wow. And he went, don't ever, ever take a liberty in this environment again. And he sent me off on my way. And uh, well, that's what I mean. It's like 35 years later and the clarity of it is like a really powerful message of it was something around the culture there of we're all equal in this environment. If you can't come into this environment and respect what we're trying to do, don't come in here because very quickly. It, it, so I talk to coaches now around the FIFO effect, the, the to be crude, fit in or fuck off. Yeah. And that was just a really subtle way of saying, this is the way we do it here. This is about developing and helping and supporting each other. And if that's not what you want to do, go away, because that's not it. And, and I think it was powerful that my dad did it so everybody else could see he's doing that with his own son. So everybody is going to be held to these standards. He's not turning a blind eye for nepotistic reasons or anything like that. It's an amazing story. It provides uh, some unbelievable insight into um, the quality of your dad's coaching for a start and then the, the environment that he'd clearly built. I think one of the questions I'm keen to get in early is one of the questions that I know for a fact, and it's a cheeky, I'm being a bit cheeky, but I'm desperate to know Go your on. opinion on it, right? The, every 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 episode I listen to, you and Jake get the opportunity, again, I say Jake like I know him, Jake Humphreys, Mr. Humphreys, <laughs> whatever you want me to call him. He, no, Jake, you get, he'd be all right with that. <laughs> you get the opportunity to ask Frank Lampard, you know, all these guys who have been in these environments, what is high performance? So I'd love to know from, in your opinion, what is high performance? Yeah. Um, I, now, I've thought about this a lot, given, because... I think doing the podcast is, it, it's a real learning opportunity for us as well, that we're sort yeah. of having our views challenged and things like that. I've, I've got, like, my, my main answer would be doing the best you can in the moment you're in with the tools that you have. So it's about, so, so that's not about winning tr trophies. That's not about necessarily being number one. It's just about doing the best you can with the information you have in the moment you're in. And I think what that leads to then, though, Niall, is that's then about consistency. If that's yeah. the application of high performance, that leads to consistency. So to give a longer answer, I think we all have good days and we all have bad days. But if you start from that premise of I'm going to do the best I can, the gap between your best and worst days is narrower than everybody else's yeah. because you're constantly reflecting on it. Have I done the best I can with what I've got? So therefore you can fix it a lot quicker rather than let the gap get too wide. So I think it's consistently doing that is to me the key to high performance. Yeah, I think it's it's so fascinating because you're usually the one asking the question. On reflection from from um, yourself and Jake, have you ever had any answers on there where you've thought where it's really challenged what your thoughts and beliefs are on what high performance it, it looks like and in a practical way? Yeah, so quite a lot to be honest. I mean, the one that stands out because it because I'm sure uh, in your world. Uh, you, like you, you're well aware of Johnny Wilkinson and yes. his reputation. And I think yeah. when we sat down with Johnny, that was uh, Jake and I both said that when we asked him what is high performance, and he went, "I can't answer that question." And it was like, "Whoa, okay, that's interesting." <laughs> <laughs> and then he sort of was brilliant at taking us on a journey um, into his thinking now, uh, in terms of the mental health challenges that he's come up with, yeah. and just believing that. Um, his, so his final answer after saying that he couldn't answer it was that all of me in every moment, which I found really fascinating that yeah. it's not something that I'd considered before. So after we spoke with Johnny, I got like quite a few uh, bits of criticism of people saying uh, he was talking about the teachings of Eckhart Tolle and the power of now, and you didn't ask him a single question about that. And I was thinking, I've never heard of Eckhart Tolle. So it wasn't, it wasn't, uh, 
deliberate omission. It was just ignorance. Yeah. And yet, I don't know if he was Tony Martin, but it led me to then go and explore what was Eckhart Tolle's teachings. And I can see why people saw the parallels with what Johnny was talking about. But that was the one that I felt really challenged me because I, um, I hadn't expected it, I suppose. And I think what it also did was it took real courage for him to want to come on and talk as freely as he did about yeah. something that's really quite deep and personal. And uh, yeah, um, and just the trust that it must have taken from him to want to do that, I found it really, really quite powerful. Yeah, he's such a deep thinker. I think my my eldest brother texted me after that and was like, you have to listen to this because I think what you see is someone who clearly was high performing. I mean, the, his in in a in the sense that he he performed physically at such a high level, but his mental ability was huge too. I suppose the question I had was, you know, when when we're talking about he uses the example of putting the groceries away, doesn't he? You know, he talks yeah. about how he has to put his groceries away to the same level that he used to have to uh, kick a goal. Is there too much? I mean, without talking about him particularly, not not, I, not but, yeah yeah no yeah, I, yeah, I, I, I don't, I don't mean be... Johnny specifically because obviously yeah. he like hugely successful. His insight was amazing. I mean, you know, I'm an overthinker. This is something that that I'm yeah. almost relating relating to myself. If we use me, I don't mind. Um, you know. When you get to the place where you're thinking, I mean, every decision I make, I'm thinking with a high performance mindset and with a normal human mindset. And, and the balance can be quite difficult from a physical, you, know, you what you eat, how much you overtrain or, or versus do train. You know, can you get the balance wrong is probably a better way of framing that. Yeah, I think that's a brilliant question. And I think the answer, like most things in life, is too much of anything can be, yeah. uh, cannot be good for you. I think there's a certain element of, like, say, for example, Eddie Jones, when he came on, spoke about this idea of, um, he just said, you've got to love the grind, mate. And yeah. and a few people went, oh, like, challenged the, the use of that term, the grind, as if. But it's like, no, no, you've got to just enjoy doing the process. You've got to enjoy it. So I think it has to be that balance of knowing it's hard work, knowing why you're doing it, and committing to the process. But then having a sense of enjoyment along the way. Uh, is really critical and I think sometimes in overthinking that the enjoyment piece can often get neglected or relegated in yeah. its importance yeah so I mean if we, if we tie this in then to some of the work that you've done I mean the commitment culture is a great framework I think is a framework's yeah. a fair way of describing it isn't it it's a framework that allows um, teams and um, organizations to try and implement some really high performing cultures for anyone yeah. who hasn't is it possible for you to give a brief snapshot of what that uh, commitment culture looks like? And then we can get into some of the, of the thoughts off the back of it. Yeah, of course. So, so the research um, is done by two guys, two organizational psychologists from Stanford university called Baron and Hannon. And I'd like quoting the work of the, of the, of the culture, because when you go around lots of teams or organizations, you say, Oh yeah, we want to like, we're working on our culture. Oh, you say, well, what sort of culture have you got? And they go, it's a good one. Or, <laughs> or it needs work. We've got a toxic culture. Or they talk about high-performing cultures. And you go, they're all quite abstract. So if you mm. went and asked a dozen people, define culture for me, the chances are you'll get a dozen different def uh, definitions. And therefore, it becomes hard for people to buy into something that they don't know if they've got that right definition. Absolutely. So I think before you start, go back and say, Rather than say high performance or good or bad or toxic cultures, rather than give them an adjective like that, what's more effective is to say to them, what type of culture do you have? And this is where Baron and Hannon's work comes into its own. So these two guys, what they did was they used to have this, so they lectured for years on the idea that culture could be a competitive advantage and everyone would go, yeah, buy that. Where's the evidence? And the reality was it was pretty under-researched. So they went into Silicon Valley and because of the proliferation of startup businesses, they had lots of people saying, yeah, we'll take your uh, research. So they started to look at what, what happens when you bring a group of people together. And what they found as a consequence is traditionally you'll get one of five different types of culture that emerge. Um, so the five that are worth sharing are the first one is a star culture. And the reason I mentioned this first now is because this is the one that most people sort of in their heads 
assume is what defines a culture. It's like where you go out your way to recruit the best players, you give them the best facilities, you then throw do as much money at them as you can, and then you stand back and you wait for all that talent to come together. So in like the corporate world, this is where people have the idea of, oh, it's about having pool tables in the in the in the canteen area and that kind of thing of all the gimmicks. Now, what the evidence says is when it works, it'll go spectacularly well. But what that also means is, because it goes spectacularly well, you get spectacular PR budgets to tell everyone how good you are. What it blinds you to is it also, it more frequently, it'll go spectacularly wrong and the fallout will be just as toxic. So when I talk about this, sometimes to use simple examples in sports, say, think of Real Madrid, the Galactico policy yeah. that they've had in place, that while they did win three consecutive champion leagues for a period of time, they've also only won the league three times in the last 15 years. So it gives you an idea of the erratic nature of it. The second type of culture you get is an autocratic culture. And an autocratic culture is where you've just got, it's like you bring in like the owner of a club, like Roman Abramovich at Chelsea. So he just fires people when it, when it's not working or you have like a head coach that comes in and they're larger than life. And it's like my way of the highway sort of thing. And while that works, while the head coaches or the owner is bought into it, when they start to go rogue or it may start making bad decisions, the culture will follow uh, in their, in their wake. The third type of culture, and I see this in a lot of rugby clubs in the occasions I visited is what I'd almost describe as a bureaucratic culture. And a bureaucratic culture is we've got like a group of sort of senior leaders that run the place and it's about rules and regulations and you've got policies and procedures and you've got your fine system. And it's all about when you make a decision, you try and do it through consensus and committee. So everything happens, but it's quite slow and as the name implies, bureaucratic. The fourth type of culture is an engineering culture. And despite the name engineering, it's more about technical skills. So people are recruited because they might have certain skills for a certain position. So you, what you find there is like, again, in rugby, it might be forwards and backs, very rarely trained together or come together as a cohesive group. They often work separately. They've got their own, almost like cliques and identities is one way I'm trying to relate it. No, but then the fifth type of culture is what um, is a commitment culture. And what a commitment culture says is, you have a really clear sense of purpose, why are we doing this? So a mission, and then a really clear set of behaviors that say, these are the rules of membership. Now, what that does by definition is, if you ever go and, like you're, like you're in a far better position than me to, uh, to articulate this now, but when I speak to players and I say to them, what do you want from your experience in a club they'll tell me two things they say uh first of all transparency tell me the rules of the game tell me what's expected of me and then consistency just apply the rules of the game and make sure everyone's playing the same game as i am so exactly. i know where i stand and a commitment culture by definition delivers those two things because you say this is what we're all working towards and these are the rules of the game of how we're going to behave now what the evidence says from these guys at stanford university is Commitment cultures over a sustained long period never fail. So commitment cultures are your best guarantee of success. So when they looked at it in Silicon Valley and the research said, what they found is on average, commitment cultures tend to be about 22% more successful than anywhere else. But there's other research from a, a neuroscientist called Paul Zak that looked at when you can create this. He found evidence that said people stay loyal to commitment cultures, even when they're offered like huge pay rises to go elsewhere. They go, no, no, I'll stay here because I know mm. this is where I'm going to be at my best. So to go back to answering the question originally, when I go and speak to people, you say, most people go, okay, so how do we do a commitment culture? But then you start to see that this affects everything. This, If you're serious about this, this affects how you recruit players, how you exit players, how you promote players, how you reward them, how you drop them, how you train every day. Everything has to then be up for grabs. So you can't say we want... So I've, I've worked in some organisations where they'll say, oh, yeah, yeah, commitment culture is what we want. And then the head coach, only as long as it suits the head coach's decision-making. Yeah, and then as soon as it doesn't... It. Yeah, so that, because we know that people don't follow hypocrites. So you can't have a head coach telling you one thing and then going off and demonstrating a different behavior. They have to role Absolutely. model it. 
So there's a great example from years ago when, I don't know if you remember when Alan Pardew, uh, when he was the head coach at West Ham, yeah. and he gave a famous interview where he said he, he was trying to rid the club of their baby Bentley culture. He felt there was too many players that were earning too much money and were too comfortable. And yet three months later, what car did he show up in <laughs> for training? The same Bentley, baby Bentley that he'd given a famous interview to promote. Now, shortly after that, his tenure was ended because when people talk about losing the dressing room, that's the idea is example. that it's just an example where people go, well, hang on a minute, if they're the rules of the game and you're implying them to us, but you don't apply them to yourself and your coaching group, psychologically, we're not going to follow you because you're going to lead us in the wrong direction. So it's a really powerful way that drives everything in uh, in an organisation that you you if you're going to view a commitment culture, it's going to lead you to positions sometimes that are uncomfortable. So I did some work years ago with a, with a team in rugby league. And uh, I had this debate with the coach there that one of our things was we were uh, team first. And there was a player that consistently used to skive off rather than do community visits. So like when they used to go and visit sick kids in hospital, they'd always make an excuse so we didn't have to do it. And in the end, I said to the coach and I had the conversation where I said, you need to drop him there needs to be a very demonstrable consequence to this action. You can't talk about being a team player and not and turn a blind eye to this guy not being a team player when it doesn't suit him. So even a decision like that, I mean, what the head coach did, he was quite clever about it. He waited till it was a game shortly afterwards where he felt he could still win without this player. Yeah. But then he had the conversation with the player saying, you're not picked and it's nothing to do with your performance on the field it's the off-field stuff that is the reason behind it and communicated that to the squad which was a really good way of showing how sometimes when you set off on this pathway it's going to lead you to like key moments that are going to be tough to make in the short term but actually you have to make them for the longer term good of the of the culture yeah, you can do so much great work and undermine it through the the hypocrisy, the hypocrisy that you talked about there. I think one of the, my one of my really the part that really interests me is um, you talked about the star culture and how it can peak and trough, and I think that's definitely true. I mean, to me, right, and this is this is again up, up for debate. It's the reason we're having this discussion. Like to me, there. Yeah. The commitment culture is such a brilliant way of keeping everybody on side. But some of the best cultures, I mean, and I refer, I'm just referring back to, um, you know, my team in football, Manchester United. Manchester United yeah. have clearly under Sir Alex had this amazing commitment culture because he very clearly said, this is how you play the game. If you don't, you're gone. And examples of Keane and others are examples of whenever that happened. But yeah. they definitely sprinkled some star culture in there, didn't they? Yeah, they did. I mean, Manchester United is a, a brilliant example of it because I think what you've seen since Ferguson left is, um, I the, the phrase I use is, it's like cultural vandalism that took place uh, at the club. But I think you go back a bit earlier. I think, so what Ferguson did very clearly was he laid down three trademark behaviours, three rules of the game that yeah. when we've been doing the podcast, we've interviewed five players now that have been part of that culture over like a long period. So you go, you go back to like Phil Neville and the class of 92 through to Van Persie coming in in Ferguson's last year. Ole Gunner so, as well. And then we've, we've had Ole, we've done Rio Ferdinand. So you start to get an idea that you're speaking to people at different stages of, the, of that evolution. And one thing they all say is there was no ambiguity about the behaviours. The behaviours never changed. So the three that Ferguson had that laid down were, uh, first of all, was relentlessness. So it's this idea of, uh, he had that great phrase, I think Steve McLaren was the first one to use it, where he said, Manchester United never get beat. We occasionally run out of time, but we'd never get beat. And it was that yeah. idea of, we just keep coming after you. So Gary Neville went on record as saying to us, I never heard us use the word unlucky once. You were never unlucky, you just weren't relentlessness enough. Like Wayne Rooney gave an interview last summer when he took over as Derby and he told the great story about when they won the Champions League in 2008. He said Ferguson got on the microphone at the after at the after party. He said he'd been there about an hour and he went and he said, right lads, uh, I'm going to bed because I'm already starting to plan how we're going to win this trophy again next year. <laughs> and went off and, and Rooney says, it, like, and Rooney tells a story, like he remembers thinking, just have a night off. But he said, actually, when he thought about it, it was just Ferguson symbolically 
laying down one of the trademark behaviors. We never rest. So that's the first one. The second one was that you've got to be a team player. So you've got to put the team above your own self-interest. And there's another lovely story that I always, so it's always like the little stories that I think rather than the big high profile things was that, I don't know if you remember in after United won the FA Cup when they won the treble in 99, after yeah. the FA Cup, when all the players went out for a night out and Roy Keane got arrested. <laughs> right. And uh, Gary Neville told me the story that he says, um, Ferguson got all the squad in and tore strips off them. Not for Roy King getting arrested, but because they left him on his own to go yeah. off with the police. And it was like, no, if you're team players, you don't leave one of your mates isolated like that. Yeah. So I love that idea of just reinforcing it. And then the third one was, you've got to have courage. And he defined courage as the guy that puts his hand up to receive the ball in the last minute of a game when we're getting beat is his definition of courage, not the one that wants it when we cruise into a 3-0 victory. So it's about doing the right thing always. So that was why he he, he, he eulogised over uh, Ronaldo or Cantonaro or characters like that because he saw them as having the courage to take a risk, to play, to win. So there's a great story. Again, Roy Keane tells this one about when uh, um, quite early on um, in, uh, in when Cantonaro joined, they did this video and... Uh, all the players got royalties. And I think when they like divided it up amongst the squad, I think it was like 300 quid a piece. So the senior players got together and went, listen, 300 quid's nothing to us. Should we put it in the pot and just one person draw it out? So whoever draws it out gets like eight grand or, or whatever it was yeah. um, as a subtotal. But they said to all the young players like Beckham and Neville and Skulls and but they said, listen, 300 quid is significant for you at your stage of your career. You don't have to opt into this. You can take the 300 quid. And most of the players did, but two of them said, no, no, put us in the pot as well. Nicky Butt and Paul Skulls. And when they drew the name out of the hat, Cantona was the one that won the eight grand. And the next day, Cantona turned up for training with two checks for £4,000 each and gave it to Skulls and Butt. And the point he made to them was, you played to win. You didn't yeah. play not to lose. And he was rewarding that that sort of courage. So that was in place all the way through at Manchester United. And that was that, like there was a complete unambiguity. If you wanted to play for the club, that was what was expected of you, that you didn't come in and invest on your laurels. So I think what he did was brilliant in that way. And he had this idea of a commitment culture that whoever came, the, the, those behaviours were passed on from generation to generation. I think what was interesting was, though, that when uh, they appointed um, um, Moyes to come in and that one didn't work out for lots of different reasons. But then what was interesting was you saw the club then lurch to an autocratic model by going after Van Gaal yeah. in terms of uh, to recruit. And then, But what they also did was they went to a star model by then throwing money at bringing Paul Pogba and Sanchez in and started yeah. splash and Falcao. And then they also had bureaucratic principles that if you believe what Mourinho says, that they were telling him he couldn't sign players over a certain age for a certain amount of money. So you've got a bureaucratic culture. So by the time Mourinho's in there, you've got an autocratic leader with superstar players that have got bureaucratic principles applied. So you've got a culture clash of three different types of cultures and only one of them can be dominant. So when you saw stories of Mourinho sort of having a fight with Pogba in training and then arguing with the board, you're basically watching three different types of cultures fighting for supremacy and only one of them can win. So that's why I think what Solskjaer has come in and done is he's come in and said, we're going back to the commitment principle. So people keep saying, oh, he keeps harking back to Ferguson. And he's not, when you go in there and speak to him, he's not harking back to Ferguson on a daily basis. But what he's doing is going back to the principles that Ferguson had and laying them down for the players to say, this is the rules of the game that you need to understand and observe. 
Yeah, it's just so interesting. And some of the insight you have from from the experiences, they're just unbelievable. I mean, we I could literally sit and talk to you about Manchester United all day. I think the, <laughs> the, the interesting part is um, the culture, the, the underlying culture that needs to be in place is commitment. And then there's like a sprinkling of stardust. But, but the important thing, if I'm right from what you're saying, and correct me if I'm not, is that even though you're bringing in these star players, or, or probably the, the better word to use is like high quality players, like a Ronaldo yeah. or a Cantor, is they have to have bought in to that commitment culture. They, if, if, it doesn't matter how good you are because the commitment culture is the be all and end all about how everybody's judged. And I think one of the words that you use through um, you know, a lot of the stuff that you do is this cultural architect um, yeah. term and, and it sounds like Cantona was a, was actually a huge cultural architect he you know by giving the two four grand checks he's reinforcing the messages that uh, Sir Alex Ferguson had so clearly put in place the cultural architect something that is really interesting for me a bit having been in the club for seven years you know having an, uh, a presence within the club I wonder if you could dig into the cultural architect because it's it is sit, sure. it does sit separately towards leadership itself yeah very much so and again it's it's important to credit where that phrase comes from it was a the phrase is from a Norwegian psychologist called, is, is a late psychologist now, but it was a guy called Willie Raylio. And what his point was, was that when, the, when you put a group of people together in a room, a culture will emerge. But what more importantly than that is a hierarchy emerges that in any group, there will always be alphas that will distinguish themselves like leaders yeah. within that group. Because that's the way we're just wired psychologically. Somebody has to take the lead and set yeah. direction. That goes right back to our primitive uh, wiring. Now, traditionally, in sort of sports clubs, leaders, these alphas, will emerge on two criteria. Either social, so they're larger-than-life characters. They're like you're a bully and loud guys in the dressing room that are, that are sort of setting the tone and making the jokes and having the laugh. Or technical. They're the best players. So when they speak, everyone listens to them as well. Yeah. Now, so alphas will emerge in uh, in that criteria. And traditionally, that's where most coaches pick their leadership group from, either the guys that they feel uh, everybody listens to or the best players. Where what you need is, if you're serious about a commitment culture, you need to instead develop cultural architects. And cultural architects are the leaders without the title. These are the guys that embody the behaviours that you've said are non-negotiable within the culture. These are the guys that don't have to be the best players, don't have to be the loudest, but they embody the idea that... It, so Cantona's almost a bit of a false example because he was the best player. So when you yeah. hear it speaks to people, they go... Like, he wasn't necessarily the loudest or the most gregarious, but he was technically the leader of that group. So the story about him was that when he came in and on his second day of training... He said to Ferguson, can I stay out and do some extra training? Yeah. He was the only one that did it. And then the day after, three or four players stayed out. And then within a month, Ferguson says, everyone was staying out and doing extras. Because if the best players demonstrate in that capacity for hard work and self-development, nobody else has really got any excuse. So ideally, in a club, if you can have your best players also embodying those behaviours, you've got gold dust on your hand because then you know that it becomes very difficult for other people to dismiss it if if if, if their if their leaders are not doing it. So I remember years ago. I mean, on the podcast last week, we did an interview with a uh, Kevin Sinfield, uh, the the Leeds Rhinos yeah. um, director of rugby now. Yeah, well, well, I know I'd, I've known Kevin since we were kids. Uh, that, but Kevin's one of those lads that whenever you'd go and visit them at Leeds Rhinos at the time when he was there. I, it always used to strike me that he was the last one out. He was the first one out and the last one in. And it was always just doing little extras and things like that. And I think he was a cultural architect because lesser talented players than him had no excuse to stay out and just do an extra five minutes because when your captain and your leader is doing it and not making a fuss, no show of it, it quickly creates that ripple effect of others doing it. So... You know, Celia Khaleesi, the South African rugby captain, when we chatted with him, like I, I spoke to a friend that had worked with him at the Stormers, and I said, what is it about him that makes him um, such a charismatic character? And he went, he's just the world's best hugger. Didn't speak about him as a rugby player. 
he said he's the world's best hugger. He said he comes in and he'll give the cleaner, the canteen staff, he's hugging them. And then when Tarbo and Becky or whoever the South African president comes in, he's treating mm. them exactly the same. Mm. And he went, so the power of what he's doing as our captain and our cultural architect and leader of showing that everybody is to be respected here, regardless of your status or rank, is powerful in terms of the impact it has on us. So you, you that... I hope is an explanation of what a cultural architect is. Um, and a question that I sometimes get asked from coaches is, so how do you do it? And the answer is, well, first of all, you've got to be clear about the behaviours. And then often just go and do anonymous polls amongst the playing group. So when I work with the team, I'll just say, given that these are the standards of behaviour, you've got two votes each, give every player in the dressing room two votes each, tell me who embodies those behaviours better than anyone else and why. Give me an example of it. And what you very quickly get is, I've, I've yet to do that with a group where you don't get at least five guys. And what, what's always interesting is, there's always at least one bolter that not, if you went to the coaches before and said, give me the five, most coaches would get four, but there's always one that is doing something that nobody else sees from a coaching yeah. group, but the players spot it. So there was a lad years ago, I did some work in, um, I won't tell you the name of the Premier League club, because I wouldn't betray the confidence of what this guy I'm going to tell you about. But there was a guy that was playing for them that had come up through the lower leagues and uh, he'd done what any sensible lad would do. He'd realised that he could make himself um, set for life uh, if, he, if he did the right things. And yeah. he realised maybe his talent level wasn't as high as the more naturally talented players that he joined. So he committed, he was, his diet was brilliant, his nutrition, his extra training, his lifestyle, his, his technical skills, his analysis was all first rate. And what was interesting was in the culture that he came into, the rest of the squad despised him because they had this horrible phrase he used in football. They called him busy. They said, oh, he's busy. Look at him. He's always hanging around. He's always staying late. And then... When we started this cultural journey with this particular squad, one of the behaviours we we identified was, they, so they came up with three. One was sensible hard work. One was uh, being a team player. And then the other one was um, persistence and resilience. And when I got the players to vote, I said, you've got two players that you can register who embodies these behaviours. This guy was in the top five. Now, none yeah. of the coaches saw it because he wasn't, he was in and out of the squad. And when I spoke to one of the senior players about him, I said, what have you put him in for? He had a brilliant, succinct summary of it. He said, you didn't ask us whether we liked him because I don't like him. You asked us whether we respect him. And he went, I can't not respect him for what he does. So this guy went from being an outsider to one of the cultural architects because what we had to say to him was, you're doing all the right things. They might not like your personality, but they admire and respect you for what you're doing. And that's enough for you. So, so it, yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry no, go on. No, no. I was, I was going to say. So, I hope that gives sort of a, an idea of how cultural architects emerge. It definitely does, and it's actually so interesting because we've done this in the club that I'm involved with. You know, we definitely. It's amazing to see the 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 thought process behind it. You know, you're you're given a piece of paper and you're saying, okay, who pick the the three to five players who most rep, who most reflect these traits. So it's, you can actually see it in action. I think one of the things, um, I'm keen to touch on, Damien, is that leadership clearly has a huge part to do with this because leadership drives cult. I mean, this is well, this is fairly well known. And correct me if you disagree with it, but leadership drives yeah. culture, culture drives performance. And within professional, the professional world of, of pro sport, performance usually, not always, but usually equals results. So yeah. how important is it that the head of the snake's driving it and, and the tie in with that? Um, what are some of your what in your opinion, what are some of the, the traits that that reflect a really effective leader? Yeah, again, it's really it's a really interesting angle now that um, I think there's a stat that I use uh, when I speak to coaches and where the, where, the, where the research comes from was there was a brilliant book years ago by a journalist called Simon Cooper that uh, wrote a book called Soconomics, hmm. where he looked at foot. So it was more football related, but he linked up with this, uh, this economist called Stefan Samansky. And the question they asked was, how important is a head coach in terms of results? 
So how much does their head coach impact the results of a team? And what they found is that for 80% of it, the, the richest clubs will win because they can employ the best talent. But then what he said is, what that leaves is there's at least 20% that is in the realms of the other stuff, the softer stuff. Yeah. So out of that, they estimate that around 10% of it is the leadership from a coach, from a head coach. So that's where I, I quote that stat of 10% to coaches. It might be a bit more, but the idea is I say to them, if your impact is only going to be 10%, I like it for two reasons. It's a double-edged sword. For some coaches, you bring them down to earth a little bit and say, don't get carried away with your own importance here. So don't walk around here behaving like an autocrat because mm -hmm. the, even if you're behaving autocratically, the impact of that isn't going to be that significant. The other, the, the more um, constructive way of phrasing that question though is to say, how much of your 10% do you feel you're extracting? which then forces them to go, what are you doing that's unnecessary and what are you doing that carries the most weight that can that can impact results? And that's where I think culture then, you say to them, so, because most of them will go, well, it's about my role is overseeing the culture. So you go, where does it fit on your agenda then? Because what I hear is, I, I've been into lots of clubs where coaches will, in my experience, a lot of clubs talk about culture twice in the season. The first time they do it is in pre-season, when, when you've got time and you've got lots of meetings that you can fill the space with, so you have a conversation. You say, "Right, that's what. Like, what's our targets for the year ahead?" <laughs> I've sat behave? in so <laughs> many of these; it's, oh, it's unbelievable. Yeah. And and I think it's 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 such a great point you make. Like every team, every amateur and professional team sits at the start of the year and goes, "Okay, lads, this year." we're going to be the most hardworking and it's the same words yeah. regurgitated every year. And the reason I like, sorry, I didn't drop, but the reason I like the commitment oh culture is because it's so accountable. I Absolutely. Because the second time, so you do it one at the start and then the second time you do it is when you lose a few games and coaches are start thrashing around for reasons and they go, it's culture. We need to fix the culture. Let's go <laughs> back and revisit what we did in pre-season. <laughs> so then everybody sits there and goes, so culture something is a stick to beat us with. It's not something that we see as an everyday thing. We just see it as yeah. something that when things are going wrong, we need to fix it. So you're right. Commitment culture is then saying, no, no, this is an everyday thing. This isn't. So this, as I said earlier on, this drives who, so who you recruiting, who gets picked in the team, why they get picked in the team, how you reward people, how you exit people from the organization. Culture drives all of that it, it drives uh your training practices because you should also have if you go back to i said we're talking about behaviors here but we also have a sense of mission and if you've got a sense of purpose you you want to play with a certain style so then you go so does what you do reflect the style that an you, identity so that old saying yeah an identity so when you hear sort of that old saying in military environments that uh, when you come under pressure you don't rise to the performance you descend to your level of training so the clubs where you'll say to us, what's your, if so what is the one indicator, the one or two indicators of all the stats that you're going to get every game? What are the one or two stats that will tell us that you're imposing your identity on a team? Mm -hmm. And so are you training that? Are you training that when you come under pressure, you deliver that those non-negotiables in terms of a certain style of play? So your examples... Your examples of this are like the Barcelona method is is the one that you talk about. They they clearly set those out. They, it was the eight second rule or something, wasn't it? I, I don't want to quote you wrong. Well, they had two at Barcelona. So yeah. one was 70% rule. So they said 92% yeah. of any football match is won by the team that keeps 70% of a, of a game, uh, yeah. of a ball. So possession was one thing that they said in training then. It's all possession-based drills. And then the other one was uh, that they want uh, the when you lose the ball, possession of the ball, your best chance of winning it back is in the first five seconds. Yeah. So when they lost the ball, they would press intently for five seconds to win it back. If they didn't, they would retreat. But if you were using that in a rugby way, it might be uh, if you wanted to play the fastest brand of rugby that was out there, you'd say, right, so how fast, uh, so when you get tackled, what's the speed at which you uh, pass it on? 
or when the when the ball goes into a line out, how long does it take you to get your players to the line out ready to throw it in? So they might be measures that if if you wanted to play an identity of fast flowing rugby, what are the two factors or the two or three indicators that would say when we do that, we're playing at a pace that will be faster than the opposition? And then the question is, in your daily training, is everything geared to being able to deliver those behaviours almost unconsciously uh, and automatically? So that's part of the cultural conversation that you need to have then that says, are you doing the same thing that you've always done? So are you saying that you want to put a new brand of rugby this season, but you're training exactly the same as you did last season? So there's so many different factors that, that impact what culture is that exactly like you say, it's about those behaviours that drive the performance that by definition in sport will drive the results that you're looking for. Yeah, one of the things that you hear people talk about, and again, um, we could we could pick any variety of top um, coaches and managers that we think are, are well respected. Have I still got you, Damien? No, yeah, yeah, we still got you. Um, is that there's a yes, there, you've got culture, and then what actually brings the culture to life is connections and that that, that kind of social connection. And um, we had Pat Lamb on the podcast, and I thought he spoke brilliantly oh, on hot on how important connections are within his environment. So they, obviously COVID's put a, a bit of a bummer yeah. on it, but they're very into like a physical connection uh, first thing in the morning. And then it's about, it's about creating an environment where um, the cultures, the, the cultures and the behaviors are, are there for everybody to see. But, but for me, the best coaches I've worked with and um, the ones that I've, kind of gravitated towards are the ones that are invested in me as a person too. Um, I've yeah. not heard you talk a huge amount about that in, in, in well, audibly. I wonder if you could talk about yeah. that aspect of it, you know, like why, if I'm going to play for a coach, I need to know that that coach, I'm more than just a rugby player to him. Yeah, definitely. There's, I'll, I'll, I'll go to my own um, original sport to explain the importance of this one now. But I remember years ago, like when I wrote my first book, Liquid Thinking, um, I, I, I was fortunate enough, I went out to Miami and interviewed uh, Angelo Dundee, that was Muhammad Ali and Sugar Ray Leonard's coach. And I was like a kid in a sweet shop that I'm, I'm sat with him and he was so kind and he was generous and, and everything. And I'm like a kid in a sweet shop and I'm asking him about what was it like in this fight with Ali and the thriller in Manila? Like, what was you thinking when you were in the corner and when Sugar Ray Leonard had his no mass fight with uh, Duran and, and he's indulging me. It's so lovely. And, uh, after about an hour, he went, Damon, he said, I think you misunderstand what I do. And I was like, well, I, I was thinking if I offended him. And he went, he said, you keep asking me about working with this fighter and that fighter. He said, I don't work with fighters. He said, I work with young men that just happen to fight. And in that one moment, it was like, ah, now I see why you were a genius, because it's about the people management. It's about getting to know the person. So I'll give you another example then from a, from a different boxing coach years later, when I was doing that book, The Winning Mindset, I spoke to you about earlier, I was sort of playing with the research and I was writing a different, but I was writing another biography of a guy, of a boxer called Thomas Hearns. And um, he grew up in Detroit. So I went out to Detroit to his gym, famous gym called the Cronk Gym, that was just seen as like, um, it was like a greenhouse of talent. So at one stage in the 70s and 80s and then into the 90s, they had like, 30 world champions in a 25 year period and it's just like forget the sport just it's unprecedented what they were doing it's crazy crazy but, so when i went out there like it, it was just at the height of um like the uh the the the, the great recession of like 2008 so uh the car industry which is what detroit was built in had shone into a tail um had declared itself bankrupt and it was all like quite a troubled city and uh, I was going in, the Cronk Gym was based in one of the poorest districts of the city. So I'm going to visit it. And I'm not going to dress it up, but to say, I was I was frightened quite a few times. Like I was going in there. I'm a white guy and going into predominantly black neighbourhoods. And I'm an English guy. So they're hearing your accent and your, <laughs> your different skin colour. And you stand out. And I had Pete, like one night in one of the hotels, I had two guys turn up at the hotel demanding to know who I was. Now, I never answered the door to them, but I, that the guns, the crime, the gangs were all yeah. quite evident. So I'm not dressing up to say that I did feel a couple of times like I thought I'm as far out of my comfort zone as I think I've travelled there. 
<laughs> what had arranged to me, uh, uh, the head coach at the time, this guy called Emmanuel Stewart. So when I get up to the top of the stairs, he's waiting for me. And my dad had known each other, so we knew I was coming. So he goes, Damien, he said, it's great to see you this morning. He said, how do you feel finally arriving here in the crunk gym? And he's like larger than life. So I thought, oh, shit, I better respond to this. So I start, oh, Manny, it's great to see you. I'm really excited. I can't wait to get in and spend the next few days watching what's going on. And he's nodding and he listens. And then he goes, that's really kind. He said, do you mind telling me the truth now? How do you really feel? Right. Now I don't now I don't know if you've ever found yourself now with verbal diarrhea. You know right. those moments where, where your blah, blah, mouth's blah. going and you think, <laughs> yeah, your mouth's going, and internally you're thinking, just shut up, just shut up, but you keep going and right? yeah. I've been and there, I'm still in me. front of him. <laughs> so when he says to me, Tell me the truth, I start going, to be honest, man, he said I'm shitting myself. I feel like I'm dead. <laughs> I don't, don't want to waste your time over there. And I start going on like that to him, and I think <laughs> You know, I admire this guy. He's one of my heroes. So he, he sort of lets me finish there and he's sort of nodding. And then he puts his hand on my shoulder and he goes, thanks for being honest with me. He said, me and you can now work together. He said, I'm going to take care of you. Yeah. And when I got to know him a bit better, I'm watching him over a few days. And I plucked up the courage. I said, Manny, can I ask you a question about the first day we met? And he went, yeah, what do you want to know? I said, why did you feel a need to ask me the second question? Why did you feel a need? He asked me how I was. I told you the answer. Why did you feel a need to push me further? And he went, he said, well, let me answer it. He said, I saw you walk up the stairs here. He said, and I asked you how you was. He said, and what you told me, how excited, didn't match what I could see. Mm. He said, so that led me to one or two conclusions. He went, you're either a liar or you're a sociopath. And he went, but if you're going to now come in this, in my world for the next three days, I need to know who are you? So my second question just speeds us up. And the answer he gave me second time went, you're just telling lies because you're nervous, but you see so you're doing your best. And he went, that's why. And he said, but every kid that comes up the stairs in the gym, like you've just come up, feels the same way you do. Any kid that comes in here, when there's a chance they're bullied, they're frightened, they're insecure, they're nervous, they don't want to look silly. And he says, I think I'm the best coach in the world, but I can't coach you when those feelings are clouding your judgment. Mm. So we had this lovely three word phrase that I use uh, with so many coaches, because I always, I think when people talk about emotional intelligence, that's again, it's quite an abstract term. Manny Stewart's three words sum up emotional intelligence. He said, contain, then explain. He said, contain, then explain. And his point was, I've got to know who you are as a person. I've got to know your story. I've got to care about you. I've got to convince you that you're safe. I've got to convince you that I'm on your side. I've got to convince you that I recognize your value. And when I've convinced you of all of that, then I can start to explain how you're going to contribute, how we're going to work together to get better. But he said, what's too many, and I see this with too many coaches, what too many coaches do is they try to explain and then contain. So they tell you what they want you to do. And then if you do it, they pretend to give a shit about you. But if you don't, so I, 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 this is a frustration. I'm helping a mate of mine that's just taken over as a head coach of a rugby league team at the moment. And we we're having this conversation yesterday about contain and explain, about the, the use of substitutions. And I was like, when you bring a guy off, the chances are he's either exhausted or he's not done the job you want. And I said, but then you bring him off and nobody says a word to him. And then 10 minutes later, you might have to send him back on. So there's no contain there. Whereas regardless of how he's done, who's going over and putting his arm around him and just listening to him and just telling him he's still a part of the team? Because you then almost gambling in the hope that he'll go back on and now do a good job. Whereas if you've yeah. convinced him that you give a shit about him, whether you win or lose, then you can give him a better chance of going back on and making the impact that you want him to. So there's lots of different ways contain then explain works. But as I say, frustratingly, you see a lot of people do the explain then contain. Yeah, it's so interesting. I suppose the question that, that automatically springs to mind, Damien, is like when you're doing this contain and explain, when you're investing, authentically investing yourself in people, right, there's, 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 there's always going to be obstacles. And in rugby, I'll speak purely on rugby, those obstacles normally sit around selection and contracts. Yeah. OK, and the really interesting part for me is uh, Damien is a player for my rugby team. I'm the director of rugby. I have invested in you as a person. Um, we have a great relationship. You might not play every game, but you play. But then there reaches a point where our professional relationship is challenged. 
how, in yeah. your experience, do, do the best coaches manage those those conversations? And then if you flip it on its head as a player, how do you how would you best be, react to those to those scenarios? Because it, it's it's brilliant. And like I said, the best coaches I've worked with um feel like they care about me and I want to work for them. And there's a real genuine relationship. But it doesn't mean that there's there's not going to be difficult conversations throughout that relationship. Yeah, and I think it's a really powerful point that you're making on that now. I've seen I've seen a few different ways. So um, what I liked was on the podcast interview when we sat down with uh, Mauricio Pochettino, mm. he had a great way of sort of, uh, and, and, and it was quite a gentle way of doing it that when I was sat there, I was thinking, I have not heard it explained like that, where he was saying that he's got three non-negotiable behaviours if you want to be a part of whatever culture he presides over. So one of them is you've got to bring positive energy. The second one is you've got to have a can-do attitude. Whatever gets thrown at you, it's how do we make the best of it? And the third one is being a team player. But what he said is, he went, that might not be right for you. Those three behaviours might not be right for you. And he went, it doesn't make you a bad person. It just means that maybe this isn't the environment where you're going to flourish. So yeah. why would you want to come into an environment where you're not going to flourish? So if I tell you up front, this is what I'm going to expect, and you say to me, I, that isn't something that I'm prepared to sign up to, he said, well, rather than fall out about it, why don't we then have a discussion of, let's find you a place where you can go and perform at your best. And I thought that was just a really gentle and quite kind way of doing mm. it. But what I would also say is, I think there's another bit for coaches there of saying that there's that old phrase that make friends before you ever need them. So what I would do is the best coaches I've seen are consistent in the way that whether you're picked or whether you're not picked, they will always sit and tell you and they will give you a reason behind it. So that, so they will say, Niall, you're in the team today and this is why I picked you. This is what I see you've done well. But then you might not be in the team a month later but they'll still have that conversation, even if you yeah. don't want it. Like there was a friend of mine, an, an Aussie coach called Tony Smith, that when players, when he used to drop them and players would go, ah, it's fine, it's fine, you're the coach. I'll go, I'm not telling you for your sake, I'm telling you for mine. I need to articulate the reasons. And you, whether you want to hear them or not is yeah. almost immaterial. You're going to get that reason and an explanation. And I think when you do that consistently, when it comes to those big decisions, whether you have to leave a club or whether you're going to get contracted or not, I think players don't have to like it, but they know that you've behaved in that consistent way all the way through the relationship. You're not suddenly pretending to be their friend at key moments. You've yeah. just been consistent all the way through it. Or I've treated you exactly the same, win or lose. So it's that idea that... that, that that again, it's that it, it goes back to that consistency of a culture yeah. that says you will always know where you stand. I'll be transparent in good times and in bad times, so that, the, uh, so that you get that idea, the, uh, that confidence. It's just like you mentioned earlier. It's all about transparency and honesty, isn't it? It's it's it, it all it all ties together when you break it down. And I think the consistency is so important. I think if if we if we kind of sum up this kind of uh, commitment culture discussion, um, let's just hypothetically suggest that the, you you are a sports psychologist in a in a club. It doesn't matter what sport, but you're confident that the commitment culture is in place. It's a good group of people all headed the right direction, but in professional sport, it's a results-based business. Yep. You've got the commitment culture, but the results aren't matching the commitment culture or, or the output of what you're putting into it, if that makes sense. What direction do you take and, 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 and how does that challenge it? Yeah, again, it's a really good question. And I think... Um, it's very common. So there's a couple of ways in which you can do this. First of all is um, prepare for these bad moments because bad moments are going to come. So mm. there's a concept. So it's often referred to, there's a, the, the writer Ben A. Brown calls it the messy, uh, the messy middle. But what mm. that refers to is it's a concept in, psycho in psychology called Cantor's Law. And Cantor's Law says in the middle of any project, there'll come a moment where it'll look and feel like a failure where you're too far in to go back, but not far enough to get through it. So that's going to happen on any project. So a nice way of doing it is prepare for the moment when it happens before you're in it. So in the military, um, the, 
again on the podcast we interviewed uh, Ant Middleton, the yeah. SAS bloke that does uh, yeah. the Who Dares Wins, and he introduced us to a great phrase called a pre mortem. So in the SAS, he said before they ever went into battle, one of the things they do is once they've articulated this is how we're going to win the battle, they then say what could kill us. So what are the things that could go wrong? And they would identify the top five things that were, that could go wrong, and then they would have a plan in place for how they would deal with it when it happened. That's brilliant. And I think when you start on a season like that, you go, we're going to lose a few games. So how are we going to handle the loss of a few games? Or, you know, we're going to, some players are going to get cynical about this and stop buying into it. Uh, the decision makers at the club won't be able to see us moving fast enough and start getting pissed off. So when you identify all these things that are likely to kill your journey to embed in a commitment culture and you can identify them when they happen. First of all, you've got a plan in place to be able to respond to it, but then it reassures you that actually we're moving in the right direction because we knew this could happen. Yes. So it then settles you down uh, to do this. The other way I think what that leads to is one of the common ways is managing upwards. So mm. you then need to manage upwards. Uh, so if you're a head coach in a position like that, you need to get your decision makers bought into this before you set off on the journey and yeah. make them aware that you can't be impatient for this because if you get because if you decide to sack us because we're not getting the results you want fast enough and you're not looking at more important measures of the processes we're putting in place, you've just made the job of your next coach that you appoint even harder because when they try and tackle this you're in it so how many football clubs do you see that almost are in that three-step cycle for decades yeah. where they appoint a head coach everyone gets excited it's a new start they hit the same cultural problems the last guy did so they sack the new head coach and bring a new head coach in so they never fix the culture they just keep replacing the head coach and keep moving around that that world and that's why I was so glad. And again, I'm, I won't apologize for speaking about Manu, but I'm so glad that Ollie Gunner's been given a chance to implement his culture, you know, because the yeah. cycle they went through with Van Gaal, Mourinho, et cetera, et cetera, Moyes, uh, uh, he's been given that opportunity to break the cycle. And ho hopefully, for me and your sake, he, he is. <laughs> but I think. Well, I hope so, because the, like, like traditionally, and I, I think this is true of all sports, like football more so is. They talk about four-year windows, that all teams yeah. have a four-year window. So Ferguson used to talk about when he had the degree of success and the cushioning that gave him, he felt what distinguished him was he could plan over four-year cycles. So you could get rid of David Beckham in year two because you know you've got somebody coming along that by the fourth year is likely to be just as good, if not better. Mm. So you could make longer-term decisions and plan for the next cycle. And I think that... For any head coach, I think the average tenure in football is like a head coach is really something like 13 months. Yeah. So all that does is force you into short-termism of getting results today and making decisions that are going to compromise you at some later stage. And, co and compromise your culture because, you, because you're definitely not buying into the process of a commitment culture uh, or something similar. You're basically pushing for results now. And I think that's one of the really interesting parts. If we... If we were to break this down then now into more of an athlete focused uh, area, yeah. right? One of the, we had A.B. De Villiers on last, uh, last episode oh, wow. and he was, he was amazing. He was very generous with his time and he was amazing in some of the insight. And, and if I'm honest, and I'm sure you've had this, having these discussions with all the top sports people that you have on podcast and off, he shocked me with some of his answers. Um, and I'm sure you've had that. And I think it ties in with this. It ties in with the, the general theme of this kind of section of questions is like the mindfulness, um, your ability to be mindful, switch from that red to blue, blue to red, the gazing method, etc. Yeah, I asked AB pretty directly, you know, before a game or before a match. Uh, the lads in the club will kill me for calling cricket the cricket match a game, <laughs> hammering me for it. Uh, my cricket knowledge is uh, sketchy enough. <laughs> no, on, get my, yeah, <laughs> so a cricket match. Um, I said, like, how do you deal with your nerves, or, or how do you put a process in place to to give you the best chance to 
uh, to, to be at the best performance you can be. Because one of the things I feel at times is I can be quite emotional. So my emo- I've played really good games whenever I've been really emotional on the edge, a physical game like rugby, I'm, the, my motivation is yeah. really high. I've also played really bad games because I probably dipped too far into the red. Alternatively, what I've played games where I've been really relaxed, laughing and joking around beforehand within reason, obviously. And then I've played really bad games when I've done that. So in my journey, I'm kind of finding still at the age of 29, finding what it is for me. And when I asked him that question, he said in, in a more succinct way, I, he kind of just said, I just go with the flow. I kind of just go with what I'm feeling. I have a process throughout the week that allows me to to prepare but whenever i feel nervous or i'm tripping my way down the stairs before i hit 149 balls or 44 balls i kind of just embrace it so i was wondering yeah. from your from your from your performance um your uh, experience in dealing with performance athletes do you have any insight into how best to prepare for matches how to flick between that red and blue and did, does it surprise you that someone who's performing as as amazingly as ab de villiers does has the ability to just kind of go with the flow yeah I, I, again it's fascinating that um that his response and some of the context of that because because you're right everybody has like their own thumbprint that will be different and unique for them i think that sometimes just the language we use uh can uh, be really interesting that i think um what i've seen from a number of guys is they talk about the work they go to work during the week but then they let go and just go to play hmm. the moment they cross that threshold and it's almost like the moment you choose to let go of the consequences that you just trust i've done everything that gets me to this moment now i just have to receive yeah. it as it comes it's quite interesting that i remember um speaking many years ago to lennox lewis uh because manny stewart the guy was telling you from detroit yeah. trained him and manny stewart said that he used to be asleep on a on a massage table like in the hour before he would go out and fight for the heavyweight title and when i asked lennox lewis about it he went if i feel like i've done all the preparation up to that moment that's my moment just to go and play, just to yeah. go and let it all come out of me. So I'm not, I'm not trying to force it. I'm just going to let all that preparation and the process happen when I get there. And I think that was something that Johnny Wilkinson almost articulated that that he felt like it it forced himself and it like he he used that quite emotive term of he said I endured my career rather than enjoyed it and it was almost yeah. like forcing it. And he said, but when he thinks back to when he was a kid. There was no force and it was just being out there for the sheer love of of doing it and being able to receive it. So to answer the question, I think my experience is it depends on what moment you choose to let go. Like, do you choose to let go um, either during the week and become quite sloppy in training and practices like that? Or is it the moment you cross that threshold where you say, I'm just going to allow this to happen now? Uh, can often be really quite interesting. And for some players, even when they cross that threshold, they can't quite let go. They're trying to control things rather than rather than just be comfortable that, that they'll have the answers, let the questions come and that they'll work great way of them to have it. the answers. I think that's an amazing way of putting it. I've not heard it described like that and it resonates very, very well with me. I have, I have an armory as a professional rugby player of all the answers, but do you go searching for the questions at the wrong time or do you let those questions unfold? It's a great way of putting it, isn't it? Yeah, I, yeah, I think so. And that's been certainly my experience of seeing some of these elite guys. So like Kelly Holmes was a really good one on this, that when we spoke to her, that she said she'd spent years almost battling her own body so that when she was sort of on the start line, there's a great example that in 1995, she won every race on the track circuit and she got to the world championships and she faced this lady called Hasim Bulmerka, the Moroccan Olympic champion. And she said, I'd never faced her before. And she said, the night before I couldn't sleep and her name just kept coming in my head. And the day of the race, I'm, I was up early and I was reading all about her and I was trying to explore. And she said, and it just sat. I was trying to find answers for how to deal with her. But by the time I got on the track, I'd almost, I had no, I couldn't answer the questions because it had sapped all my energy, the worry yeah. uh, that had gone. And so when we asked her, like fast forward uh, nine years later, when she won the two gold medals at Athens 2004, 
she said at that stage, we said, how much of it was down to your ability to control this, this emotional turmoil in your head? And she attributed 80% of it, 80% of her success came down to that mental game. Because her point was in the Olympic final in 2004, she said the top five women, their best times were all 0.2 of a second difference. So she said, so technically we were all as fast as each other. Mm -hmm. The difference was negligible. So she said the difference had to be how we could deal with it under pressure. And it was almost that letting go. She felt that rather than beating her body up and she'd done everything she could to get on that start line in the best shape possible, then she just allowed it to happen. And, and to use that language again, she let the questions get posed and she found the answers because she knew that she trusted that she'd done the work to do that. Yeah, it's brilliant. I absolutely love that analogy. I'll be, I'll be, I've jotted it down there, that little bit of stardust. I think, do you believe in, in, in mindfulness or do you term, do you, do you tend to use a different term or a different t- choice of words for it? I mean, you've kind of touched on it there, but the, the, I ask because the the reds are blue in a physical sport like rugby. I mean, the Kiwis were the ones who first used it um, after they got yeah. chucked out of the, the World Cup. And I'm sure you've got extensive knowledge of it, but it, it seems to resonate with a physical, emotive sport like uh, rugby. Like you can, be, I can very quickly be spat into the red if someone gives me an, yeah. a, a clobber on the face and my ability to go to the blue, to use their terminology, um, before because I have to throw a line out is really interesting to me. So what are your thoughts around that? Or do you use some different terminology? No, I love that. I, I love that language because of the simplicity and the accessibility of it. I think yeah. what I found is that the, the, like when you like, there's lots of metaphors out there for it, like the chimp or the elephant yes. or the monkey brain and things like that. What I find for that is uh, they're all great. They're all talking about the same thing in essence. But what I find is using language like that, um, I've, I've been in some cultures where it just gets taken and almost lampooned and made fun of rather than rather yeah. than actually seeing it as value. So I think that almost like the neutral language of colours is really effective that yeah. and it's easy to understand. Uh, so no, I'm a big fan of that. And, then, and I know some people might say it's semantics, but I think that's all part of the culture as well. Uh, the, uh, that we have I think um, I don't tend to use the term mindfulness I'm, so I'm a big advocate of it but I often get people to talk about just savouring so you talk about just savouring the moment um, and get them to recognise them because I think when you talk about that it taps into this idea of enjoyment yes. and privilege so, so rather than get them to necessarily focus on um, going internally and using language like that, I say when you savour it, you force them to almost go internally to pick up the small details of the moment they're looking at, whether that's the grass, the wind, the kit, the opposition, the fans. Just savour what's going on around you and give yourself a moment of doing that it can be really powerful. It almost relates them back to their why, doesn't it? Which is which is such an important and brilliant way of doing it. You know, the reason everyone plays a sport or a game in the world is because it has to, to any level that's that's um, successful in inverted commas is because they enjoy it. Enjoyment such a big part of it, and I think people will say, you know, enjoyment can breed. Um, some really powerful, not always wins and losses, but some powerful in, uh, experiences. Yeah, definitely. Like, like when I think of my trademark behaviours, like my own non-negotiables, one of them, Niall, is is about having a laugh. Yeah. And because, again, when I said to you in my introduction, I was thinking about what sort of kid I was at school. And when I thought, well, what were the lessons I enjoyed? And the lessons I enjoyed was where I was having fun. Mm. And when I loved it, I tended to invest more energy into it. And because I invested more energy, I explored. And because I explored, I learned something about the craft of what I was learning and got the mechanics rather than just doing it to get a result, to get an outcome. Hmm. So I think I try and do that in, um, I'll apply that and say, if it doesn't feel like it's going to be a laugh or it's going to be fun, you're just doing it and it feels like a grind that isn't, that is going to feel like a slog of doing it. So trying to just savour the moment or enjoy it or have a laugh with it is just a really good way of, like you say, when you, you know, when you're in the muck and bullets, when you, when you're knackered and you're playing in the 70th minute of a game and you, and you under the pump, you've got to remember, why am I doing this? And the answer is because I actually love being out here. It's, it's a privilege rather than a, rather than a pressure. 
Absolutely brilliant. I couldn't have summed it up any better. I think the the last the last and final question um, I'd like to just get some insight from you is just around the people who've impressed you most. So if we can get some insight into the people that you've worked with and um, that you're comfortable naming, I think people who've yeah, created sure. people who've created some really high performing cultures, people who've um, maybe re- represented the cultures particularly well in environments just some insight into the, the real kind of standout people that you've worked with well, yeah i mean again it's a really good question um i think to answer it is a lot of it will be people that people listening to this will go oh, i've never heard of them and i think part of the reason yeah. is is it's because they were doing the work in the shadows it, yeah. it's that stuff to go back to the start of that really appeals to me the people that are just doing it that are unheralded that are doing it because they just love doing it. Uh, so I'd start the first one, I'm biased and I know I referenced it, was being around my dad and seeing it from a really young age of just somebody that was doing that. I'll tell you a nice, I'll tell you a nice anecdote actually, that uh, which I'm not sure, I mean, my dad's very poorly these days. He's got yeah, dementia. Um, yeah, no, it, but there was a lovely story that, um, I used to go and help him in the corner. So I used to do the spit bucket, right? And mm. uh, we uh, we were working once. We had a lad that my dad had trained uh, uh, that um, ended up headlining at Madison Square Garden in New York, right? And he was fighting a guy called Miguel Cotto, who was a Puerto Rican Hall of Famer. And the lad we were working with was making quite a big leap in terms of class. So he was always a heavy underdog. But the lad... Um, wanted to take the fight because the money he was going to get was going to allow him to buy a house for his family. So it was like a non, a no brainer. You've got to take this. This is your show yeah. of doing it. So we went out there to, uh, uh, to New York and we were there for the week and Cotto was a huge underdog and there was a huge Puerto Rican fan base there to see him. So like when we turned up for the weigh-in, they were doing like throat cutting gestures. And, <laughs> and I must admit, I like, I walked to the room and it was intimidating so anyway, we're in the dressing room in uh, Madison Square Garden and there's about 20,000 in there and the atmosphere, you can hear it outside, is incredible. And what happens is when you're in the dressing room for a fight, the trainer will be bandaging the hands of, um, uh, of his fighter. And for a title fight like that, the opposition is allowed to send one of their uh, camping just the to observer. make sure that you're not doing yeah. anything illegal yeah, as an observer. So I think like the British Boxing Board sent some guy into Cotto's dressing room and their like their camp just basically made him stand right at the back of the room and like anytime he said anything they just sort of like treated him with disdain but this big sort of brazen Puerto Rican came in and uh, he's sort of standing and he's making a lot of fuss and a noise so we finished the bandaging of his hands and literally we finish it it's about a 20 minute job we finish it this guy kicks off not happy with this do it again so the the New York boxing official goes um, yeah okay he's entitled to this do it again so we unwind the bandages, do it again, get to the second time, and he kicks off again. Not happy with this. Do it again, do it again. So the New York official goes, do you mind, guys? Just Please just accommodate him. Let's just save a fuss. Right, fine. So do it again. So we get into an hour now that this has been going on for, and the fight's getting closer. And by the time we get to the third occasion, right, just as we finish it, he kicks off again this Puerto Rican. Ah, I'm not happy. Do this again, do it again. So... My dad sat there, and at this stage, I think he's about 70. This guy who's making the fuss is in, is in his early 40s, so he's given away 30 years. So this guy's making the fuss, and my dad goes to the New York official. He goes, can I ask you a question? He said, who are we supposed to be listening to here? Are we listening to you, or are we listening to this guy, this Puerto Rican? So the New York official goes, you're listening to me, and this Puerto Rican goes, no, you're not. You're listening to me. So I, I knew what was going to happen about five <laughs> seconds before it happened. Right? I saw it. So my dad sort of, like, he shuffled and then stood up and just head butted this guy. No this Puerto way. Rican, right? <laughs> Ed butts him, puts him on his ass, and he gets carried out, right? And in the fuss and the shock of seeing like a 70 year old bloke doing this to a younger bloke, uh-huh. everyone sort of stood round. But this is the key bit, right? As we all sort of stood round, but that just turns to all of us, but to the box he's working with, and he goes, Nobody's going to bully us tonight. Mm. And that to me was a moment that I remember thinking, that's brilliant coaching. Because when I asked him afterwards and we chatted about it on the flight back, 
I said, why did you do that? I said, because I know there was a purpose to it, because it wasn't just acting in a peak of anger. Yeah. I saw that you planned it. I said, why did you do it? And he said, well, what happened was, he said, when I was bandaging his hands, he said, the first two times he was fine. But when I had to do it the third time, I could feel his hands start to tremble, that it started to get nervous. And he said, it was only imperceptible. Nobody else could have seen, but I felt him start to shake with nerves. And this guy had got to him that he was that making us go right coaching. down to the wire and stopping his preparation. And he went, when I felt that tremble in his hands, that was when I realised I needed to do something to break this cycle of being bullied. So he went, so I just decided I'd make a bit of a fuss and stick one on him <laughs> just to send the message of nobody's going to bully us tonight. It's, it's we have to impose ourselves. And I remember thinking, that's the work in the shadows that nobody would have seen. But yeah. that to me was a, a moment of great coaching because it was just because it set the tone for showing yourself. You might not win, but you go out and you demonstrate who you are, your best version of yourself. So that's just like a, a bit of a personal uh, anecdote from that. But I love it. Like, but I've seen coaches like, there was an Australian coach that I was, I'm very close to, a guy called Bill Sweetenham that yeah. came over. He's from like the mining town of Mount Isa and he came over here and headed up British swimming for a while. I liked him because he had a reputation as being quite uh, quite difficult and a prickly character, but I always felt he cared and he was very decent and like he, he, he wasn't somebody he pretended not to be. He, he was very genuine. Um, coaches like Tony Smith, I've uh, been lucky enough uh, in rugby league, uh, worked with Tony for 10 years at three different clubs at Leeds with England and with Warrington. Uh, and again, I just thought he was... Um, I, I'm talking about their human qualities rather than them as coaches, yeah. which is probably worth pausing to go. They were just incredibly decent blokes. They were humble. They had integrity and they they cared deeply. As important as some of their coaching qualities, no doubt about it. Yeah, definitely. The, um, and I, like, I think the nature of the work I do means that I, I, I always say this to coaches that I I'm, I'm there for them. I'm not there for, like, I don't get caught up if a team wins or loses because mm. my impact on that is negligible. I Like, I hope they win, but that's not my role. I don't, like, if you come in and asking me whether you need work on lineouts or <laughs> things like that, well, I, like, you're wasting your time, you'll get a ridiculous <laughs> response. But my work is to almost be um, in the corner for the coaches and to almost help them get the mm. best that they can do at, uh, out of the players. So... The, 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 like I've, I've, I remember being in the coaching box years ago uh, when I first started and there was a coach that, and again, this is just, it's like an anecdote that I sometimes use with coaches because it tells you something about the culture. And this particular coach I was working with, this team were under pressure and he was under pressure and he turned to his coaches in the box with him and he went, what do you think we're doing there? And both of his coaches went, um, there's 20 minutes left, boss. And I remember thinking, I could have told you that. Mm. I don't know anything about the sport and I could have told you how long's left on the clock. And then I remember saying to the head coach afterwards, I went, you've created a culture of time tellers, not truth tellers. And that's your problem because for whatever's gone on in your relationship with them, those guys didn't feel comfortable enough to say to you, why don't you try this as an idea or tactically, why don't we try this? So instead, the safest thing they could say to fill the silence was just to tell you something like the time, and I said, which was a clue to the culture that he'd created, that yeah. he hadn't created a culture where they felt they could challenge him or throw ideas in without the fear of getting it wrong or, yeah. or, uh, or consequences. So I often say to coaches that I'm with them to help, and I'll be a truth teller for them, that I'll tell them things with, discreetly and subtly that hopefully help them have that knock-on effect in their own culture and how they can do it. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 brilliant. And I think, you know, as we look to round up, I just want to say a big thank you for taking the time, Damien. You've given so much insight to, like, the real ins and outs of some really high-performing cultures and environments. You've given your philosophy and your kind of framework, is the word we used earlier, on how that can be created. Um, you've been so generous, and I really appreciate you taking the time to jump on. I think I've stolen about an hour and a half of your time. Um, I know the Zoom world <laughs> waits for no one, and I'm sure you've got plenty to be doing, but I just want to say a huge thank you because the 
the insight, the angle that you've given my podcast uh, to today is one that we haven't touched on. Um, and it's been really, really enjoyable for me as a personal, uh, from a professional point of view, as, as a rugby player, but also for everyone who's going to listen to this. No, well, listen, th- th- I mean, from my point of view, thank you for inviting me on that. Like, I, I do have a sense of that you're doing this in your own time. You, you know, I, I know how hard work it is running a podcast and and, and trying to um, share ideas with people. So I really admire what you're trying to do. I think it takes courage as well that, I'm a big fan of people that are not necessarily typecast in their roles. Do you know what I mean? They're not just yeah. rugby players. They're not just coaches. They're people that have got a curiosity and an interest wider than that. And I've, you know, I've got huge admiration for what you're trying to do. And therefore, it, you know, I'm grateful to be asked, but it was a real privilege to come and chat with you. So thank you for having me.